I was born in India and I think uh, uh, it was day one uh, when my parents pointed at me and said, uh, you're either going to become a doctor or an engineer. And <laughs> so my, my life was pretty much mapped from there. So, um, but uh, you know, I, I was too young to say I want to do math at that point, but, uh, but uh, somehow I, you know, uh, I was able to uh, pick up a bachelor's in electrical and electronics engineering. And, uh, and also uh, convinced my parents uh, uh, that I wanted to do something in mathematics, so I ended up doing a master's in mathematics also. Um, and then I came to the United States, uh, did uh, uh, my doctoral work in, um, in applied mathematics. And that's the first time I learned about what applied mathematics is all about. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, in general, you have a, an applied problem from uh, medicine or defense or environment. And the whole notion of how do you take that problem and try to come up with models and try to actually validate these models by writing computer codes and then try to actually uh, be able to do some analysis. So this is a very interdisciplinary training that I received uh, you know, when I did my doctoral degree. And uh, after I finished my doctoral degree, I still had this one question that I kept on asking for my school days, is when I see an equation, I would ask, when am I ever going to use this? And this kept on coming again and again and again. I'm sure there's several students here, when equations are flashed on screen or when the teacher writes the equation on the board, you tend to ask the same question. When am I ever going to use this? And uh, then I had an opportunity to go to uh, do my postdoctoral research associateship. Uh, and I wanted to challenge myself. So I decided to go to bioengineering. And uh, uh, so I'm uh, sitting in this room. And uh, right next door is this lab with uh, you know, 10 to 15 kids coming each day. These are uh, everybody from undergraduates to postdoctoral students coming and cutting open chicken hearts and they're taking this tissue out and they're putting this under the, under the, you know, they're trying to do all these stretching experiments, biaxial, uniaxial, and I didn't know any of those things. So I'm just sitting there watching, you know, fascinated at what they are doing and then there would be a moment then they would finish collecting all the data, then they would come to me and they would say, you're the mathematician, tell us everything about the tissue. Uh, and this is when I realized I gained some respect in the group. So I said, okay, uh, this is my, my chance to show them what I can do. And so I was able to study that tissue from the data point of view and tell them something about if the tissue is weak or the tissue is strong and things like that, which had further repercussions on the doctor making a decision on invasive or non-invasive surgery. And so it really started to make sense what mathematics was uh, all about in terms of STEM. So the message I am going to probably send you today is, uh, you know, STEM, uh, which everyone thinks of it as uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, I, I have a special place for M in the STEM. So I, I feel it's more of science, technology, engineering through mathematics. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So, um, but if we go back and think about where STEM evolved, you know, where did this term come from? Uh, there was a letter from uh, President Roosevelt to uh, the head of the Office of uh, Scientific Research and Development, um, uh, you know, uh, thinking about a program that can uh, identify scientific uh, uh, and American youth, uh, uh, you know, scientific talent, uh, you know, to see if we can identify these kids and train them to uh, create these innovations that can benefit the society. So in response to that, uh, the head uh, of the Office of Scientific uh, Research and Development, whenever Bush, um, for those of you, uh, if you want to put this person in context, he was the vice president of MIT, the founder of Raytheon, uh, you know, the person who was uh, heavily involved in the Manhattan Project during the World War, and uh, he was also, uh, you know, credited uh, for the initiation of the National Science Foundation, for example. So. He actually uh, mentions uh, in his uh, response that you know it's about uh, finding this rare individual uh, who's an exception and you know who will come and make notable contribution. I do want you to note that he uses the word he everywhere. So disparity in STEM was you know from long time back, okay, in uh, gender disparities, okay. So um, but uh, he was a very powerful force actually, and so this communication was going on, and then uh, uh, after a decade later, you know the uh, Russians. Uh, they launched the Sputnik, and uh, the Sputnik launch for, to the United States was more like your favorite team lost the Super Bowl, right? So, and so you had to do something. So everybody was really charged up, and so uh, uh, you know this is the time when the best and the brightest were actually brought together, and uh, you know uh, to come up with some uh, innovation that's going to revolutionize the world. And what did we end up doing? Well, we put people on the moon, right? And then we brought them safe back. Now that's a STEM event 
that everybody will remember, right? So, and, uh, and, the, and the whole thing evolved so fast after that, you know, things started evolving in terms of technology, Yahoo and Google and all these giants came along and uh, Y2K happened and, you know, all these things were going on. At the same time, what ended up happening was this growth that was too fast, you know, uh, it was uh, missing a lot of other important things. For example, STEM for all students, the need for, uh, you know, STEM educators, and the need for, uh, you know, training more women in STEM. And so all these things were not given too much importance. And so what ended up happening was, you know, uh, the United States still lags uh, behind several of, it com of its competitors in all these areas. And uh, just to give you an idea, this is uh, moving forward 50 years later. This is, uh, you know, the results of the mathematics reading and the science uh, international assessment that's given. It's called PISA. Uh, it's the Program for International Standards Assessment. It ev evaluates 15-year-olds uh, across 65 countries, which control 90% of the world's economies. You can see where the United States is in mathematics, and that's the average. And you can see some of the countries like Liechtenstein and all these guys here. And so. Uh, you start to wonder, you know, such a, uh, you know, we're doing so much uh, great things. And so, just to give you an idea, so this is the, the PISA test were introduced in 2000. And, uh, uh, you know, this is, I just plotted some of, uh, just a few of the countries here. And this, uh, you know, Germany, for example, this United States, this the average, uh, you know, this is in science and math. And you can see all these other countries here. So fast forward to 2003, uh, US is still somewhere here, but notice what Germany and Liechtenstein, somehow they've done something in the country in those three years. And watch what happens in 2006. Uh, these people seem to be, Germany starts to make some real difference. And so his 2009, and US is still around this region, United Kingdom for some reason is starting to come down also. And then uh, this is 2012. The average is still here and we are still here and you start getting these new, new players in the, in, in the whole thing. There's Shanghai uh, that comes up uh, with a very high score in math and science. There's uh, Singapore. So I sit on the National Academy of Sciences for uh, US, uh, it's a US commission for mathematics instruction, and we compare the curriculum of different countries. And then we start to wonder what's going on in these countries, you know, what are they doing uh, that's different? So when you go to the Ministry of uh, Education website uh, in Singapore, uh, there is a slogan that they have right there. And the slogan is, teach less, learn more. And then when you go to Finland, which I have not named here, uh, uh, you know, their slogan is, learning by doing. And so, you know, when, I, when we sit on these committees, you know, we try to come up with some brainstorming ideas so that we can send a letter to the Secretary of Education. And we kind of came up with something, uh, you know, after a lot of uh, uh, brainstorming, and it turned out to be, test less, learn more. And uh, we are still trying to see how that is gonna fly. So, but, uh, but then there is other uh, outside uh, uh, influence on, uh, on different, uh, you know, how people think about STEM. For example, you may know this famous celebrity. Uh, I'm sure you all know. This is Barbie, but this was a special Barbie, though. This Barbie came in a, in a pack, uh, you know, called Teen Talk. And so this is Metal that introduced this Barbie in 1992 with about 260 phrases that it can talk. One phrase being, uh, math class is tough. Now, if you have such a diminutive plastic toy under 12 inches makes such a statement impacting the society and culture, that's bad news, right? So, <laughs> so the AAUW, which is the uh, American Association for University and Women, they wrote an article in Science, you know, talk, criticizing this, this whole thing. Of course, Metal didn't take all the toys back uh, from the shelf, but they just said, okay, we'll take that one phrase out. You can return your Barbie and exchange it and all that. Right? I mean, you have so many little girls crying already. So, but then, uh, uh, this is another celebrity, so you probably recognize her as, uh, as the 2013 uh, Miss America. And, uh, you know, she is a strong advocate for STEM right now, but uh, one of the things uh, that she used to do when she, you know, received the award and all that stuff, she would go to these places and talk about, uh, you know, how cool math and science was when she was in middle school, but then after she went to high school, there was a, st a, st a disconnect. And then when she came to college, she, believe it or not, she actually registered for biomedical engineering. And then uh, in the first year, she figured out that's not for her, and she publicly admitted that. And uh, she said, you know, I went to go, uh, she went to go do fashion technology. So, which is, which is, she's just one of the many cases that happens like this. You know, several of students who start in STEM, they don't end up in STEM. And this is very common. And so what does, what, I mean, where does this turn off happen? Well, 
maybe it's in our education. So maybe, you know, as uh, educators, you know, we are thinking one thing and the students are thinking something else. So I'm trying to, uh, you know, bring the good things for the students and I'm going in every day with burgers to make them happy, right? And the kids are sitting there thinking, why is this guy giving burgers every day? Why not pizzas for a change? It's, uh, it's that simple a philosophy between teaching and learning. That's the gap that is out there. So, uh, you know, uh, something that I have learned as a teacher is, is teaching is not just about instruction. It's more about facilitation right now. So, so if you can facilitate the student to achieve what they want to do rather than help them achieve what you want them to do, that's a bad thing. So, you know, so that's a common misalignment uh, uh, in education, uh, you know, which if we can fix, there'll, there'll be a lot of great things that can happen. So, for example, let me take some specific examples. How do we teach modeling division? Four divided by half. By the way, this is not an easy problem, right? It's a fraction that I'm dividing. So, of course, I can quickly say, oh, because we'll change the mathematical form and write it as four divided by half. And students are going, why? And then you say, wait a minute, not just that. Let's do one more thing. Let's do, let's say flip and multiply and then do four times two divided by one. You're like, what? I mean, I, I don't understand anything of what you just said. But what we just did was we just left them in a state of confusion, you know, perplexion, you know, they're bewildered, they are disoriented, you know. And we give, the, give a chance to people like Barbie to come and say, uh, you know, things like math is hard. It's a perfect example, right? So, so, so how can we fix this? Well, let me give you a simple example. So maybe I shouldn't be doing this problem. Maybe I should be doing four divided by two. Well, maybe I should change math to English first. So maybe I should take four divided by two and say, how many groups of two are in four? Well, you could uh, either uh, model it on paper or I just happen to have uh, some weapons of math instruction. So uh, <laughs> here's this four cubes for you, okay? So I'm gonna, you know, all I have to do is just make groups of two. So all I have to do is just, you know, make groups of two, end of story, right? Four divided by two. So I have groups of two here, so that's two of them, that's it. So it's so simple to teach division. Well, that's a simpler problem I took, right? So let's go back to the problem about uh, four divided by a half then. Well, if you think about it, if I want to do the exact same thing, all I'm going to do is ask the question, how many halves are in four? It may look tricky. I just, uh, you know, if you want to check out PBS Learning Media, I have been doing some videos for PBS. And uh, I did this one particular video, but uh, I'm not going to show the video, but I'm just going to show you pieces of it. Uh, you know, if you were to take four holes, four of those uh, cubes there, four sets of those cubes, each set having uh, two halves, and all you have to do is ask again the same question, how many halves are in the four holes? And if you just simply count it, you get eight of them. You don't have to sit and do all that flip and multiply business and all this stuff. But it's just a matter of you know, reaching different types of children in the same classroom. People that are kinesthetic, people that are auditory, people that are visual. And so it's just a matter of how you can get all those learning styles. And, and not only that, you can also ask them to go ahead and build a model to you know, relate it to other models and things like that and ask them to uh, convince themselves of the answer, work backwards. And so there's so many different things that one could do. And so, you know, help them uh, build their habits of mind and, uh, you know, develop a flexible way of thinking about solving problems and make it dynamic, you know, keep on changing uh, the ideas. And it also helps to reinforce something called, uh, you know, multiple representations in problem solving. You know, if a kid wants to do tables, let them do tables. If a kid wants to do concrete uh, with uh, manipulatives, let them do it. So it's just a matter of uh, the teachers being facilitators to make sure that you are able to connect all these different representations. How do we bring Barbie back into math? Well, uh, you know, we did something interesting this last summer, and this has uh, become very popular now. And uh, what if actually we took Barbies into the math classroom? So uh, here's Barbies there with uh, rubber bands. And uh, you know, this is one time I had to sacrifice some Barbies. When I said sacrifice, I meant actually putting, uh, tying Barbie uh, in the leg and then you know, throwing Barbie from the top. And uh, the big problem was that we gave all the teachers, by the way, is uh, you know, how many rubber bands do you need so that Barbie does not hit the ground? Okay, that's the whole problem. Okay, so, uh, you know, that it's almost like it's an engineering problem. You want to make sure that you don't, you know, crash the floor, but at the same time, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, you try different trials. And it turns out that uh, this is almost a phenomenon, right? So, you know, you can easily take Barbies. You know, kids are really excited about, uh, you know, uh, boys are really happy about, you know, hitting Barbie on the floor. But, but you know, kids are really, you know, they go all these heights and they try different types of things. Uh, they form tables. 
you know, and they collect all this data. And the beauty is you can teach a whole lot of things. They're collecting data. You can put a scatter plot. You can draw a line of best fit. You can talk about, you know, how the distance uh, Barbie falls is related to the number of rubber bands. You can ta teach variations, for example. And you can take it to high school because Barbie is going to do this, and that means there's a sinusoidal wave that is coming. And so you can talk about trigonometry out there. So it's amazing what you can do with Barbie. Right, so if I'm going to write my next book, which will be titled "Barbie Does Math," so uh, <laughs> you will see all these things there. So, but uh, you know, it turns out that uh, there was a study that was done between how teachers work in the United States versus Japan, for example. So here uh, in the United States, you know, most of the time is spent in uh, in, the, in the curriculum part, and then you know, there's very little time for people to collaborate and work together. On the other hand, you know, Japan is all about collaboration, and they work. The pyramid is exactly the opposite. It's all about how we can put our strengths together and come up with this rich lesson that we can, all our classes will benefit. So it's not Mrs. Stiles' room or Mrs. John's room. It's one room where everybody can teach math, physics, and everything and in under one problem-based approach. And so this type of thing, uh, you know, we have been able to take it back into the classrooms. We work with about 200, uh, 250 teachers uh, every summer on content-focused uh, content uh, uh, professional development on different uh, topics in mathematics uh, across K through 12. And then they form collaborative teams and then take it back into their classrooms in the form of what is called as lesson study, something that comes from Japan. And, and we, we try to see if the, how the collaboratively planned lesson unfolds in the classroom. And, uh, and it's worked out like a charm. And people are learning uh, from it. It has created vertical articulation. Different grade level teachers are working together on the same lesson. And that's the power of this lesson study. And uh, of course, uh, here's what you're seeing, actual lesson study in the classroom, where kids are now actively working with manipulatives. Uh, you may have heard about the marshmallow challenge. This is just another version of the marshmallow challenge, trying to build the tallest, cheapest, strongest structure. Uh, kids are in, uh, talking about geometry, talking about cost. Uh, here's kids actually using bamboo skewers to measure the height of a building, uh, you know, talking about proportional reasoning, and you know, they're not given anything else. And here's people actually, to, uh, kids in Robinson High, for example, uh, building catapults to talk about quadratic functions. That's what they're learning that particular day. Not only are they building catapults to learn about quadratic functions, they're learning about accuracy and precision, two of the terms that people think are the same. In if you're an engineering student, you know that they are different. And so uh, the whole idea of bringing, making math fun uh, you know, by learning, by doing, and this is exactly what you're seeing here. And most importantly, teachers, getting teachers excited by actually, you know, here's a, a professional development session that we are doing where teachers have, uh, are humming into a small chip that uh, I work with uh, Dr. Natalia Paixito with, and this is connected to an oscilloscope, and the oscilloscope is recording waves, and we get to talk about how to manipulate these waves and how to manipulate the amplitude, how to manipulate the frequency and period and things like that. Why is it important? Well, we actually, uh, you know, the bioengineering, they are actually working with uh, uh, putting this chip into a wheelchair and so that a kid, uh, you know, who, who's a paraplegic can actually move the wheelchair just by humming. Talk about STEM, okay? So the next time the teachers are gonna teach some trigonometric equation, wouldn't it be fun if they start with, here's a wheelchair and here's how we are gonna actually uh, bring the connection today. And you know, it's, it's really fun to take math uh, in that way. And uh, of course, it uh, ties very well into uh, the university collaboration. And uh, you know, it's, uh, I've been fortunate to work with lots of great uh, students here, including Joe and uh, uh, AZ. And so here's uh, a project that I worked on, which involves uh, a f uh, arterial, uh, you know, this is a focal dilatation of the arterial wall, which is called aneurysms. And we are able to model this using mathematics, and which took us all the way to uh, the po posters on the hill, uh, on the Capitol Hill, that's with uh, uh, Mark Warner. And, uh, you know, we are able to teach students about, uh, you know, simulations and how you can use mathematics to drive these simulations. So I want to leave you with one message, uh, which I always try to promote. Our educational system is always geared towards uh, teaching uh, a certain way. And the way is, you know, here's the mathematics, go solve the problem. Here's the STEM, go solve the problem. I challenge you to reverse this philosophy and think about uh, changing this to here's the problem, let's find the mathematics to do it. Thank you.